Welcome everyone to the next video in the Getting Started with Burp Suite series. Um, if you haven't checked out the previous videos, that'll get you up and running through uh, starting it, installing it, upgrading it, um, configuring your browser, uh, determining which browser you want to use, and, uh, and then really diving into the, the proxy capability. In this video, we're going to start looking at actual functionality. We're going to take a look at the target tab today. As you can see, we're starting on the dashboard, and if we look at the proxy, because it's orange, which means it needs our attention, we do have the proxy running and the intercept is on. So I'm going to shut the intercept off as I'm not quite ready to start intercepting traffic. Uh, again, as a reminder, I typically only begin interception when I'm ready to inspect an actual request that I'm making from an application. From here, we'll go ahead and move to the target tab. Now, the target tab has three sub-tabs, the site map, which is the one that we're going to be probably most interested in here, the scope tab, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then the issues definition, which really doesn't play a role in this demonstration today. So with the site map, you can see that it's already started to log URLs that have been requested through the browser. So in the background here, I have my browser open, it's on a website, my blog, and this browser, Firefox, is configured to use the proxy. So there's all sorts of things inside of the browser, inside of all of our applications, typically JavaScript, that are you know, kind of constantly beaconing out. They're initiating HTTP requests even when we're not interacting with the page. And that's actually what we're seeing here. So the sitemap allows us then to, because all of that traffic is going through Burp, it's allowing us to build a map, a sitemap of the application that we're testing. Now, You'll notice that the application that I'm on is actually 0xevilcode.com. That's my blog. But when we look at the sitemap tab, this is to cdn.syndication.twimg.com. And that's going to that's gonna affect our scope. So we'll talk about scope here in a minute. But essentially, any traffic that's passing through the browser, from the browser through Burp, is going to get picked up in this, this sitemap tab. So depending on your scope, what are you actually investigating? you might find that you're getting, you know, not only the request to evilcode.com server, but any of these additional widgets or, or marketing platforms or anything else that that application has installed. Now, in order to start building our sitemap, really building our sitemap, we want to go to the site and we want to start interacting with the site. So there I just clicked on the banner that requested the homepage that generated an HTTP request. And what Burp is going to do is as it's looking at that traffic, it's going to give us really sort of two views into what was going on with that application. One is that any direct HTTP requests that were made from that page will show up, and they'll show up here in this darker black color. So here you can see, for example, there was for sure a request to evilcode.com, and then as we expand that, we'll have um, just the forward slash, which would indicate the, the root of the website is that black color, but everything else is that light gray. So the other thing that Burp is doing for us is it's also passively looking for other URLs, looking for other paths in the application that we can then go and explore. So it's really helpful when looking at an application for the first time to use this passive capability to gain a better understanding of, of what the site will, what's all there, what's all, what's all available in this site. Now, the limitation with this is that in order for Burp to give us this grayed out sort of passive crawl, um, there has to be a link to it. So if let's say this has an admin panel, uh, WP admin, for example, we're on a WordPress site, WP-admin is, is the default location for the administration template, typically not linked to in the public facing part of the site. You can see here, there is no WP-admin because there's no link to it. Now, before we get into looking at the data that's present here, um, I want to come back to, to the scope. And the what's important with the scope, especially as we start handing off capabilities to other tools, such as the intruder and the repeater, is that we, we don't want to we don't want to engage, we don't want to crawl, um, we don't want to scan any any asset, any server, any application that we don't have permission to do. That can get us into legal trouble. And so one of the things that can help us, really help us with that is the scope and defining the proper scope. It's also very common if you're on an engagement, um, let's say you're doing a penetration test or a web security assessment, that the, you know, the, 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 the organization might give you assets that they do not want you to interact with or engage with. And so you can immediately add those to your out of scope. Um, you set up here with Burp to make sure that it never makes those requests on your behalf. So scope is, of course, very, very important. 
Um, in order to help work with the scope, you can have this tab in which you can do things more, a little bit more manually. Um, but from the sitemap tab, it actually makes it quite easy in that we can right click and very quickly add, in this case, let's say we want to we wanna scope everything down to just this one website, evilcode.com. So we can add that to the scope. You'll get a dialog asking you about if you want to stop proxying out of scope items. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. You can check that box and make that a permanent decision if you'd like. You'll notice that we get a log up here at the top, or I'm sorry, not a log, but a message indicating our decision right there. And now if we go to the scope tab, you'll see that only included, we're only including items in the scope that we've defined, and it's this one URL. So to help kind of highlight what that scope has allowed us to do, I'm going to highlight all of these items, delete the selected items, go back to the website, make a request for the home page, and now you'll see that we didn't get any, any additional items in our sitemap that were out of scope. So that's the basis of why the scope is important, how you set it, and then how it affects your usage of actually um, of using BERT. Uh, beyond that, you can continue to explore. Of course, you have an entire um, you know, sitemap that you're trying to build. Uh, there are active ways of scanning for a site to, to sort of brute force discovery as well. Um, we're not looking to do that right now. We're just using the passive capability. The next interesting thing about the target tab is not only does it provide us with this sitemap, but then it allows us to start to investigate the actual HTTP request and response. So if we highlight a domain, it'll give us a listing of all of the requests that were made, the host, the HTTP method, the URL, if there are parameters. So there's a column for parameters. And, and of course, that can be very interesting because if we're looking for parts of the application that we can tamper with, that we can send data to, to see how the application responds, to see how it behaves, then we might want to filter on requests that have parameters. We have our status code, the length of the response, the MIME type, of course, title, comments, and time requested. So other, other important information that helps just to understand sort of the sequencing of events as we're exploring and mapping these applications or L application. Below that, we have the raw request and response. So this is just the raw HTTP. This allows you to look at this content. Um, maybe you identify uh, a unique header value that could be tampered with or um, you know, really just anything. It just, again, it allows you to see that content. The raw mode is, is just that. It allows you to look at it in its human readable ASCII format. Every once in a while, you might get some hex content that you want to investigate. Typically, not. I don't see this as much with the request side of things, more with the response side and, and looking at the actual body. Sometimes you'll get some binary data, some, some zip data or something in there that looking at the hex gives you a little bit better insight or perspective. Um, but you can see here, you're just going to get a view, same content, it's just going to be as if you were looking at it in a hex editor. Similar with the response, we'll have the, the pretty, the raw, so you can see the pretty just adds a little bit of formatting to the HTML structure, trying to create that, that hierarchy so it's a little bit easier to visually parse. Um, of course, the hex and raw view, just like we talked about here, and then the render view, where it'll attempt to render that HTML and show you what that page looks like. So any of these really can be utilized in, in whatever capacity that you're looking for. Beyond that, we have the inspector tab. We have request attributes, the protocol, the method, the path, information that you can see in the raw request off over there to the left-hand side. It's just broken down, a little bit easier maybe to, to quickly parse and understand. Very similar with the request headers. There they are, just broken down and of course the response headers as well. So it's just another way of looking at it, essentially the same data. The last area that I would like to point out is just the filter. You can see that there is a message about filtering and that it's hiding certain items, CSS, image, and general binary content. What you can do is you can click on that and that will bring up your filter settings. And this will allow you to, again, sort of fine tune what you're seeing. On, on occasion, I might be looking for something very specific when I'm you know, exploring an application and I know I'm requesting it because I can see it in the browser or maybe I'm using the developer tools in the browsers and I'm, and I'm looking at the actual network traffic. But then when I come to burp, it's not showing up in my sitemap. Well, it could be that a filter is set here. So always double check if you know something should be there and it's not, 
It could be a scope issue. It could certainly be a filter setting. So here you have the ability to, to sort of check this out. Um, the last thing that we'll talk about here on this particular page is just that this can become a really good starting point for um, you know taking something we've discovered and you know sending it to uh, another tool that's available within Burp. So an example of that, let's go back to the site. We've got a search box, and search boxes are interesting because they allow us to put in data, and then we can see how the application handles it. Uh, if we go back to Burp, there's our request that we just made. We can now right click and you see that we have the ability to send. Send to intruder, send to repeater, send to sequencer, send to comparer. And that makes it easy then to, to take you know, a URL that we're interested in and, and quickly pivot it to another capability so that we can maybe dig a little bit deeper to see if there's a problem there. So that's what we'll do here in the next videos. We'll start to tie together all of the capabilities, but for now, we really just wanted to focus on the target tab. Again, the importance with the target tab is that it helps us to build a site map. It helps us to understand the, you know, the total footprint of the application that allows us to abuse the application and, um, and, and discover those vulnerabilities so that ultimately the customer can make it better. So stay tuned. In our next video then, we're gonna just transition very smoothly from the target tab to the next capability, which will likely be to the intruder. So I hope you join me then. Um, until then, thanks for watching and I'll talk to you all soon.